The views expressed and the opinions given by the individual host and their guests do not necessarily reflect those of Para-X, its affiliates, or its sponsors. It's coming. All these voices. My name is James Hershey. Right back. Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of Staring Into the Abyss. I am your host, horror author James Hershey Jr. And with me as always, my co-host, old boy James Ash. How you doing, brother? I'm doing pretty good. How's everybody doing tonight? Tonight we're going to celebrate Memorial Day as only Staring Into the Abyss can. Tonight's episode is going to be on the Revolutionary War. And it's going to be about a particular part of the Revolutionary War, and that will be the the black soldiers, basically, in the Revolutionary War. Um, I'd like to start the show off by reading something. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the government. That, as we all know, is from the Declaration of Independence. Most Americans, when they hear that, they are overcome with feelings of patriotism, feelings of, of pride and hope. It kind of just sends a shiver down your spine, you know? There's a certain portion of our society that just doesn't feel that way. They don't feel ownership of the De Declaration of Independence the way we do. And that kind of came as a shock to me. About two weeks ago, I was speaking to a young black man. He was in his early 20s. The conversation started off pleasant enough. It was, you know, hey, I loved your books. And I'm like, thank you. And then, you know, that kind of conversation in the beginning. And then we started talking about a little deeper things, a little heavier things. And we got to talking about our country and, and about our founders and what an amazing place this is. And he said something that to me was really shocking. He said that he did not feel like the promise of the Declaration of Independence or the Constitution applied to him. And I was shocked at this. I could not believe what I was hearing, that an American would, would say such a thing. And I, I asked him, why is that? Why, why do you feel that, that the promise of America doesn't apply to you? That doesn't make any sense to me. And he said that during that time period, it was a bunch of white people fighting for white rights and his people were all in chains. He had no part in the, in the, in the revolution. It wasn't his revolution. The revolution for his people wouldn't come for, for many, many years. I felt saddened in a way because here was a man who was an intelligent man. I mean, he was well-spoken. He, he seemed learned. I mean, he, he knew a lot of things in the rest of our conversation. But in this one particular area, the history of his people, he just didn't know it. And I don't necessarily think that that's his fault because this stuff isn't really taught in school anymore and I think that's really sad but here was a gentleman that there was a really great guy and a nice guy and he had no idea 
about the amazing heroes that were in the Revolutionary War that were his people. The, the role that, that the black man played in, in the Revolutionary War isn't taught in school, and I think that's a travesty. I decided right then and there when, when we had that conversation that I was going to do this show, and I was going to try to tell all, about all the people that, that were there, at least some of them, because we don't know all their names, and I don't have enough time really to go through all their names anyway, even if we knew them. But we do know a handful that, that history is remembered, and these men were were heroes, and I, I don't think it's right that, that nobody knows who the hell they are. That's something that I wanted to try to do on this show. Now, a lot of people don't realize that around 15,000 black men fought in the Revolutionary War. Okay, some fought for the British because the British came in and they offered freedom to a lot of the slaves if they would join them. So you had some slaves that, that ran away and joined the British and fought on their side. And then you had some on that fought for the, for the Patriots, for us, for America. Some of those were, were slaves because they had a policy back then that you could pay somebody to fight in your stead. So a lot of times what a slave owner would do is he would offer one of his slaves their freedom if they would fight in his stead in the war. So you had some slaves that fought on America's side that fought for their freedom, basically. And then they went into the military and fought. But then you also had a lot of free men that fought as well in the revolution that were black men that were not slaves. They were born free and they died free. They never lived in bondage or, or in chains. And that's another thing that isn't really taught in schools, that people don't understand that when they think about that time period, they think that everybody was a slave. Like all the black people that existed at that time were all in chains. And that's just honestly not the truth. You had a lot of free men that were black that lived their lives as free people, just like the white people did. The very first person that was killed in the Boston Massacre, which is actually, I guess you could say, the first American casualty in the, in the Re Revolutionary War, was actually a black man. His name was uh, Crispus Attucks, or Attucks. I don't know how you pronounce it, but it's Crispus Attucks, I think. By 1779, 15% of the Continental Army was black. What we're taught in school was that it was a bunch of white guys fighting for their independence, but 15% of the Continental Army was black. In between 12,000 and 15,000 total, you probably had for the uh, Continental Army somewhere between five and, and eight or nine thousand uh, of the troops were actually black. But I mean, these guys that were in the Continental Army, they fought at the Battle of Lexington and the Battle of Concord, um, Yorktown. Um, they were at Valley Forge with Washington. They, you know, that famous painting where you see them crossing there and Washington standing up in the canoe. They were there with them when when he crossed the uh, when he crossed the Delaware. They wasn't just integrated units. See, that's another thing. Some people will admit that that uh, there were black people that fought in the Revolutionary War, but they paint a picture like, yeah, they were there, but they were grunts, and they had to have a white guy telling them what to do. You know what I mean? Because they they weren't allowed to have any kind of responsibility or any kind of of power at that time, and that's simply not true either. There was actually three units in the Continental Army that were made up of nothing but black men. Okay, you had the Rhode Island 1st Regiment. They fought um, at Newport, at uh, Monmouth, and Yorktown, and they really distinguished themselves in the battles. I mean, they were badass dudes. Um, you had the Black Bucks of America, which were from Massachusetts, and uh, they, they had their banner, their fighting banner, is actually still on display at the Historical Society there in Massachusetts. So you can actually go and still see that, which is kind of cool. And then they had a, um, a regiment that came from Haiti, that the French supplied us, because the French were our allies in that war. And they took the ideals of liberty that they learned from the revolution, from America. The ideas that, that came from the Declaration of Independence about all men becoming equal and being equal, and that we were endowed by God with our rights, not by governments. So governments did not have the right to take away our rights because they came from God. You know, they took all those ideals and they took them back to Haiti with them. And they actually used those ideas to hype up all of their, their brothers over there. And they actually overthrew the French, which ruled Haiti at the time, which was kind of cool. They actually made a republic just like we have, you know what I mean, over in Haiti at the time, which was really neat that, that they could take the ideas that made us great, that gave us that spark of freedom and liberty that made us want to be free men and women. They took that idea and they took it back and they... They did it for themselves in their country, which is amazing. On this show, 
I'm going to tell you a little bit about the people that history remembers. Okay, I'm going to tell you their names, and I'm going to tell you a little bit of information that we have from them. So we'll start with Philip Abbott. Um, Abbott was a servant uh, to the family of Nathaniel Abbott. They're from uh, Massachusetts, Andover, Massachusetts. When Nathaniel Abbott's men were called to the Battle of Bunker Hill, Philip Abbott fought and died with them. So basically, he went with Nathaniel Abbott, who he was a servant to the family. He went alongside of him, and he fought alongside of him, and ended up dying there at, at the Battle of Bunker Hill. Jack Arabis, he was a, actually a slave of a uh, wealthy Connecticut merchant. His master offered him his freedom if he would fight in the place of his son, because the merchant's son was supposed to go fight in the war. And as any father does, you don't want your kid to die. So he made a deal with uh, Jack Arabis and said, hey, if you go take my, my son's place, then I will give you your freedom. So he accepted the offer and he went and fought in the American Revolution. And he actually served with distinction in the Revolution and fought valiantly. And he lived through it, which was an awesome thing because back then war was a, was a scary thing because you've all seen the movies where you line up across from each other and, and fire and stuff. It was kind of nuts. I would never fight like that. I'd be hiding behind something. But he actually lived through the thing and he came back. And unfortunately, after the war, his master, the merchant, he changed his mind and he didn't give him his freedom. That was kind of really wrong. Jack Arabis, he didn't think that was right either. And so he decided that he wasn't going to put up with that and he he basically ran away. But he didn't get very far because he was captured the next day and they put him in a jail in New Haven. And then his master sued to try to get him to return and Arabis got a, um, a lawyer, a guy named Chauncey Goodrich. And Jack Arabis actually won the court case because the judge ruled that uh, Arabis was free as soon as he went and fought because the deal was if he went and fought then he would be guaranteed his freedom and the second that he stepped on a battlefield and and started fighting then he actually earned his freedom is what the judge said so he did not allow the merchant to have his property back which was Jack Arabis a slave he, he said you don't have to be a slave anymore you don't have to return to him you're a free man now because you won your freedom it was actually one of those cases you've heard of of the term precedent you always hear that in the news when when they have a court case and they say yeah well there's precedent for this that case actually set a precedent and it enabled hundreds of black patriots that fought in the Revolutionary War to win their freedom because they fought in the Revolutionary War. So not only did Jack Arabis win his court case and get his freedom, but because of, of him standing up and, and, and fighting for his rights, hundreds of other patriots that fought got their freedom as well, which is an amazing thing. And it kind of flies in the face of this whole idea that, that they always try to push in culture today, that black people had absolutely no rights and that they were looked at as lower than dirt. That simply wasn't the case. Here's a case right here where the black man was in the right. The judge noticed that and recognized that and said, you know, you're, you're right here and you're free. So it was possible for black people to get justice, even in the time of the revolution. I wouldn't go so far as to say it was the norm, but it did happen. Um, the next one is going to be Caesar Augustus. He was the last colonist that was wounded in the Battle of Lexington. He was from Massachusetts. Um, there's not a whole lot more that we know about him, but at least we know his name and we know that, that he was in the Battle of Lexington and he was a black man. The next one is Charles Bowles. Bowles uh, was born in Boston. His father was, was an African and his mother was actually the daughter of Colonel Morgan. He actually enlisted. Okay, he wasn't constricted. He wasn't uh, drafted. He, he didn't go for his freedom. He actually enlisted because he loved his country. And he served the entire war from the beginning to the end. His first two years he uh, spent in the service of an officer and then he re-enlisted. And when he re-enlisted he said, I don't want to be in the service of an officer anymore. I don't want to be a servant. I want to fight. I joined to fight for my country and that's what I want to do. So he made it clear that's what he wanted to do so they, they allowed him to fight. And so then the rest of the war he actually fought as a soldier, not as a servant. And um, after the war he went to New Hampshire and he became a farmer. There's an old story that he was a slave to the Tory family. That's not true because his mother was white 
So most likely he was a servant and not a slave. The next guy on our list is a gentleman named Seymour Burr. He was the slave of the brother of Colonel Aaron Burr. Everybody knows who Aaron Burr is. He, he fought the duel with Hamilton and killed Hamilton. Seymour Burr was the slave of his brother and they were from Connecticut. During the American Revolution, Seymour Burr ran away and he joined the British because like I said in the beginning of the show, the British were offering freedom to any slaves that enlisted. So you had a lot of slaves that would try to run away and get to the British somehow. But Burr was found bef before he could enlist with the British and he was returned to his master. Now, instead of beating him or jailing him or killing him, what his master did was he heard out what was going on and he actually offered Seymour Burr his freedom if he would enlist in the Continental Army instead of the British Army. That's what Burr did. He enlisted in the Massachusetts 7th Regiment and that was led by uh, Colonel John Brooks and he was at the uh, Siege of Fort Catskill. I mean he went through the cold and the starvation and all that stuff that happened there. The next gentleman, his name is Cyrus Bustle. Okay, Cyrus Bustle was born in Burlington in 1732. Um, his father was an English lawyer and his mother was a slave. And because the sta uh, status of the child follows the status of the mother, that meant that Bustle was a slave. And he was trained to be a baker by a guy named Thomas Pryor, who was a Quaker. At the age of 36, Bustle got his freedom. And he enlisted in the American Revolution for the Continental Army. He actually fulfilled a, a really important need that the army had at that time and that was bread because he was trained to be a baker he knew how to make bread and he was good at it and that's what he did in the army was he made as much bread as he possibly could make to feed the soldiers and he must have done a very very good job because he was actually commended for his service and received a uh, a silver piece medal by general george washington himself so he was actually commended by george washington for the job that he did Okay, so imagine this. Let me take a break from, from uh, Cyrus for just a second. I'll get right back to him. But imagine you're taught in school that this is a white man's war. You were taught in school that black people were slaves at this time and were not heroes, that they did not serve with distinction or did nothing of note at this time in history, right? And here's a guy, Cyrus Bustle, who not only served the Continental Army, but he was instrumental in feeding the Continental Army. And he did such a magnificent job that he received a commendation and a silver medal from the father of our country, George Washington himself. It kind of really makes you think, doesn't it? Why aren't they telling you these things? Why is there a whole race of people that are not being taught how amazing they are and being taught the contributions that their people have made to this great nation? These are the kind of things that made me sad when, when that young gentleman I was speaking to said those things to me because it's like, do you, do you know how amazing some of your people were in the Revolutionary War. I mean, like I said, here's this guy, man. He, he was commended by the, by the first president of the United States in person and given a medal. And after the war, uh, Bustle and his wife, they moved to Philadelphia. They had eight kids and they became Quakers. And uh, Bustle was also an early member of the Free African Society. Um, that began in uh, 1787, I believe it was. Um, and this was a society established by um, the black founders, Richard Allen and Absalom Jones. And uh, when, when Bustle ended up retiring from baking, he opened up a school and he died in like 1806. Uh, the next guy's name is Oliver Cromwell. Um, he was born in the colony of New Jersey near Burlington. There's some confusion about this guy's birth date. One source I found said it was May 24th, 1753, and another one said it was uh, 1752. I guess that really doesn't matter all that much. It's like one year apart. But he was a light-skinned guy. He was a farmer, and he was raised by the family of John Hutchkin. Most likely, he was born a free black man. I can't 100% guarantee that, but everything I found on this gentleman, it, it looks to me like he was born free. He served in the uh, 2nd New Jersey Regiment under Captain Lowry and Colonel um, Israel Shreve. He was in the Battle of Trenton, the Battle of Princeton, Battle of Brandywine, Monmouth, and uh, Yorktown as well. And he was actually on the famous crossing of the Delaware on December 25th, 1776. And George Washington personally signed Cromwell's discharge papers at the end of the war. And he also designed a special medal 
which he presented to Cromwell. So here's another guy that was given a medal by George Washington, who was a black man who served with distinction in the war. He later applied for a pension as a veteran. He was like one of those guys that was just so well liked, like everybody loved him. And he couldn't, he couldn't read or write, so he couldn't really apply on his own for his pension. Here's the, the sense of community that they had in that time period and how well liked this guy was that he actually had local lawyers, judges, and politicians, all of them ganged up together and helped him to apply to get the pension and then lobbied for it. Okay, so he ended up getting $96 a year pension, which back then was a, was a, a good amount of money. Okay, it was enough that he was able to purchase a 100-acre farm. Cromwell had 14 kids, and he ended up moving to Burlington in his later years of his life. And he actually outlived eight of his kids, and he lived until he was 100 years old, and then he died. He's actually buried in the Methodist Courtyard in Burlington, where some of his descendants actually still live to this day. So he was a definite hero in the Revolutionary War, in my opinion. The next gentleman, his name is Prince... Easterbrooks. In the first battle of the American Revolution, which was the Battle of Lexington, there were at least 10 black patriots that fought in that battle. And Easterbrooks was one of those guys. Um, he served under Captain John Parker, uh, and he was among the first to actually engage in the war. He was wounded in that battle when the British forces fired upon the citizens of the town. And he was mentioned in the Salem Gazette, um, the Newbury Gazette, and the Marblehead Advertiser in April 21st, 1775, as a Negro man who was wounded in Lexington. At the time period when it happened, it was actually covered in the press. And if you, if you do the research online, you can actually go back and you can actually look at the, the actual, well, not the actual papers, but pictures of the paper that that was actually read to him, which is kind of a cool thing to see. On the next guy, his name is Samuel Francis. He was born most likely in 1734, but it could have been as early as 1722 there's varying accounts. Back at that time there wasn't really birth records like there is now so you're going by a lot of different kinds of information when you try to ascertain these things so that's why there's some discrepancy sometimes in the birth date just so everybody understands. At some point in his life he immigrated to the colonies and he ended up settling in New York City. He actually ended up becoming an owner of a tavern which is really cool because once again you're taught in school that all black people were slaves at that time and they were you know lower class citizens and they didn't have any rights and they were just scum of the earth basically is how they were looked at I mean here's a black guy that owned a tavern you know he was a business owner a respected position and it's rumored that during the Revolutionary War the tavern that he owned was actually a meeting place for the Patriots in the planning of the war on December 4th 1783 George Washington delivered the uh, his farewell to his officers at that tavern Washington and Francis had a strange kind of relationship. It was a personal relationship and it was a business relationship. So not only did he do things at the guy's tavern and they had a relationship that way, but they were actually friends. They dined together at the old 76 house in uh, Tappan, New York. And Francis cooked for Washington at the uh, Tappan house. And he ended up being a, a, a steward to President Washington in New York City and in Philadelphia from uh, 1791 to 1794. And uh, George Washington Park Custis, which was Martha's grandson, uh, he remarked one night at a state dinner about Francis. He said, Francis in snow white apron, silk shorts and stockings, and hair in full powder, placed the first dish on the table. The clock being on the stroke of four, the labor of Hercules ceased. That's what Martha Washington's grandson said about Francis. He's also pretty well known because he helped to feed the 13,000 American prisoners of war that were kept around New York City, including those that were on those prison ships. And they had like prison ships that were in the water there in New York City. Francis and his wife, Elizabeth Daly, they had seven children. One of them was named Elizabeth, but they called her Phoebe, which I don't know why they did that. But I, I found that in the, uh, in the research I did. And during the revolution, uh, Washington he, he came and he stayed at a place called the Mortier House, and that's in New York City. And he uh, actually wrote to Francis and asked Francis to help him find a housekeeper. So Francis sent his daughter, Phoebe, which is that Elizabeth I was talking about. And it's possible that he sent her because he had heard a rumor that an attempt was going to be made on Washington's life. That's some of the speculation that I found in the research. They say that's why he actually sent Phoebe, because he knew he could trust her 
because it was his daughter. Other people speculate that it could be that Phoebe discovered the plot while she was working for Washington at Mortier House. Either way, whether he sent her because he thought it, you know, had heard a rumor or whether she just discovered it. One of Washington's bodyguards, Thomas Hickey, was actually executed for attempting to poison General Washington. Phoebe and her father, Francis, are actually credited with discovering the plot to kill Washington. And Francis is credited with removing the poisoned peas intended for Washington's dinner. Because that's what they did, was they poisoned the peas that they were serving him. And apparently Phoebe discovered it and then let her dad know, and he actually took the peas off of Washington's plate. And Phoebe was 10 years old at the time, by the way. So she was a little, a little kid at the time when this happened. And then Hickey ended up getting uh, executed in June of 76. Um, in 1781, at the Battle of Groton Heights, that was uh, in Connecticut, there were 185 patriots, both black and white, um, and they were trying to hold off 1,700 British uh, that were led by Bene Benedict Arnold. The Americans were outnumbered like crazy. I mean, it was 1,700 to 185. So they knew they had no chance, but they weren't going to give up. So what they did was they retreated to uh, Fort Griswold, which was nearby, and they barricaded themselves in there. And the British stormed the fort. The Patriots fought until they ran out of ammunition. And so they began fighting with bayonets, and they started hitting them with the butt of their guns, and with pikes, and with knives, and swords, and just anything they could get their hands on in their bare hands. During this last stand, a gentleman named Jordan Freeman speared Major Montgomery, who was leading the charge on the fort. A guy named Lambert Latham picked up the American flag because it had been shot off its pole, and he raised it back up over his head. The British were finally able to capture the fort, and a British captain asked who was in charge. And Colonel William Later answered, I did want you do now. So basically saying, I was in charge, now you're in charge because you, you took it over the place. And he stepped forward and he offered his sword to the British officer, which, you know, as everybody knows, is a sign of surrender. He's given up at this point. Um, the officer took Layard's sword and he thrust it into his body all the way up to the hilt. Stabbed the dude. Okay, Lambert, he retaliated on this British officer by taking his bayonet and just stabbing the dude with it and, and killing him. Okay, Lambert, right after he did that, everybody just fell upon him. And he actually ended up with 33 bayonet wounds and obviously died. But he died avenging the death of his commander in what was a low-down and terribly dirty, dirty move. He was a hero as well. So basically what happened was he stabbed the commander and everybody stabbed him to death. And the British were kind of upset that their commander got killed that way. In response to the death of their captain, what they did was they killed everybody. They took no prisoners. They slaughtered every single man, including Freeman. And there's actually a plaque at the fort to this day that honors the men for their bravery. Freeman had been the slave of Ledyard. That's the guy that was trying to turn over his sword and got stabbed. But Layard freed him. Instead of leaving, Freeman stayed with his former master and he got married and he actually enlisted when the fighting began so he could fight side by side with his former master and fight for his country. And he died in service of his country basically as a hero. Um, the next gentleman's name is Primus Hall. Hall was the son of Prince Hall, founder of the Masonic Lodge that bears his name. He was born in uh, 1756, and he was the servant of Colonel Pickering. And Pickering and Washington were friends, and that's what brought Hall and Washington together. And the story goes that after one visit, uh, Washington decided it was too late for him to return to his own camp. So he asked Hall if there was enough straw and blankets to make him up a bed for the night. And Hall said that there was. When the officers retired for the night, Hall busied himself until they were asleep, so he, he kind of did busy work until the, the men fell asleep. And then he sat on a stool and went to sleep himself. During the night, George Washington woke up and saw Hall sitting on the stool. And he realized that Hall had given up his own bed so that Washington could have a bed to sleep in. So Washington woke him up and told him to join him in, in the bed so that he wouldn't have to sleep on the uh, stool. Um, Hall tried to say, no, 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 you take the bed, I'll take the stool, it's all good. Uh, but Washington wouldn't hear of it, and he said, no, you're going to sleep in your own bed. You know, so that's what they did. During that time period, that was a, that was a normal thing for, for men to share a bed when they were traveling or, or when they was, you know, in, in battle and stuff. Um, his dad, Prince Hall, 
was born in 1735 in Boston, Massachusetts. And he was a slave of William Hall. His son was, was Primus, and he was a servant of another Boston family. In 1762, when he was 27 years old, he joined the Congressionalist Church. He married a slave by the name of Sarah Ritchie, and Sarah died eight years later, so Hall married again, this time to Flora Gibbs. A month after the Boston Massacre, Hall was freed by his master. Um, he had a certificate that said he was no longer reckoned a slave, uh, and would always be accounted as a free man. After he was freed, he worked as a peddler, caterer, a leather dresser, and he was actually listed as a voter and a taxpayer. So here you have a black man in the revolutionary time period who was listed as a voter and a ta taxpayer in official documents. And he owned a small house and a uh, leather workshop that was located in Boston. The question of did he fight in the Revolutionary War is one that's not 100% sure. I believe he did, but there were actually six men that lived in Massachusetts at that time period that were named Prince Hall. It's most likely that he was the Prince Hall that served in the Battle of Bunker Hill because he supplied the leather drum heads to the Continental Army. We know that because he sent a bill to uh, Colonel Kratz in April and that shows that he supplied the, the drum heads for the Army. Most likely he's the one that served in the Battle of Bunker Hill. Before the war began, Hall and 14 other free black men joined the British Army Lodge of Masons. When the British retreated from Boston, the men founded their own lo uh, lodge, and it was called the African Lodge Number no. 1, which was la later renamed in Hall's honor, which was that Masonic lodge I was talking about. It took 12 years to get the official charter. Hall was the first Grand Master, and it was the first ever Black Lodge. Hall became one of Boston's most prominent citizens, and a leader not only in the Black community, but in the community overall. He spoke out against slavery, and he spoke out against the denial of rights to black people. After years of complaining about the lack of schools for black children, he set up one in his own home. So this was a guy that didn't only talk about it, he did something about it, okay? He, he didn't think it was right that there wasn't enough black schools, so he set up his own black school in his home, and he brought black children in, and he educated them. And in his last uh, published speech that took place at his lodge in 1797, he spoke out against violence. Um, he said, Patience, I say, for were we not possessed of a great measure of it, we could not bear up under the daily insults we meet with in the streets of Boston, much more on public days of recreation. That's a quote from his, from his uh, speech. And he said, How at such times are we shamefully abused, and that to such a degree that we may be truly said to carry our lives in our hands, and the arrows of death are flying about our heads. Tis not for want of courage in you, for they know that they dare not face you man for man, but in a mob which we despise. He died in 1807, and it was a year after his death that the lodge he founded decided to honor him and rename itself as the Prince Hill Grand Lodge, and that was the Masonic Lodge that I was speaking about. Um, another gentleman's name is uh, Benjamin Mays. He carried the nickname of Daddy Ben, and he was actually a royal prince in Africa. He was brought to America and sold to a Colonel Scott. And during the Revolution, the British uh, wanted to find Colonel Scott, but they couldn't find him. They tried, they just couldn't locate the dude. Um, but they did end up capturing Mays. And in an attempt to get him to reveal the whereabouts of Scott, they decided they were going to torture Mays. So what they did was the British hung Mays up, and then they cut him down right before he died. Okay, so basically they put him in a noose and they hung him by the neck. And right before he was getting ready to die, they cut him down. And they didn't do that once. They didn't do it twice. They did it three times. They hung this guy almost to the point of death and then cut him down. Because they were trying to get him to give away the location of his master, Colonel Scott. Even though they tortured him, Mays, he wouldn't give it up. For that bravery and loyalty, Mays was awarded a gold medal. And he won the admiration of the people in what is now Maury County, Tennessee. He died in 1829. So here's another guy who was heroic and who won a medal. So what is this, three, maybe four people now we spoke about that were actually uh, won commendations and, and received medals in the Revolutionary War? Another gentleman's name is George Middleton. Middleton was a colonel in the Continental Army, and he led one of the only three all-black units in the Continental Army. 
His unit was the Bucks of America, and that was based out of Boston. We don't know exactly when the Bucks were formed and when they were disbanded because that information is just lost to time. I mean, we, I tried and tried and tried to find that, and I just couldn't find it. But their actions during the war are legendary, and they earned the recognition from one of the leading citizens of Boston, John Hancock. And yes, it was that John Hancock that we all know so well. Um, he presented the unit with a special silk flag, and that flag also resides at the Massachusetts Historical Society. George Middleton was also a member of the Prince Hall Freemasonry Lodge, and it's believed that a lot of different members of the Bucks were uh, members of that lodge as well. And he ended up getting appointed Grand Master in um, 1880 or 1889, and after the war, he founded the African Benevolent Society. And that was in 1770 or 1796. And he was also instrumental in quelling a riot in Boston. That shows that he had leadership qualities and was respected in the community that he was able to quiet down a riot. Um, he was also a master at breaking horses. Um, he worked as a coachman and he played the violin. And one of his famous quotes is, freedom is desirable, if not would men sacrifice their time their property, and finally their lives in the pursuit of this. And he said that in 1808. Um, another gentleman's name is Salem Poor. He was born in the 1740s. He purchased his freedom in 1769 for 27 pounds. And 27 pounds was roughly a year's salary for a working man at that time. He married a free black woman by the name of Nancy. And before the war began, they had a son. Once the war started, he left behind his family to serve the Patriot cause and fight in the war. Uh, Salem Poor fought in the Battle of Bunker Hill. He was in Colonel Fry's regiment. And he is actually credited with shooting uh, the British Lieutenant Colonel, James Abercrombie. And he conducted himself so well during the battle that no less than 14 officers, including Colonel William Prescott himself, petitioned the legislature of Massachusetts, declaring that Poor had behaved like an experienced officer and a brave soldier. And this is a quote, a reward was due to so great and distinguished a character. And of all the men who served in the battle, Poor was the only one who, who was singled out for that honor. And we don't exactly know what he did to earn all that praise. Um, maybe it was because, you know, he shot Abercrombie, or maybe it was a combination of that and the fact that he just fought so well and with so much valor. Uh, we don't really know. But the petition states to set forth the particulars of his conduct would be tedious. So what that tells me is that his acts of bravery and, and heroism were so numerous that it would just be tedious to list them all. So he must have really been a hero in that battle, is what it looks like to me in my research. Um, he also fought at the Battle of Saratoga, which, as everybody knows, was the turning point in the war. And he was at the Battle of Monmouth as well. Um, he was honored with a U.S. postage stamp also, which is really cool. The next gentleman, his name was John Redman. Uh, John Redman served in the 1st Virginia Regiment of Light Dragoons. Uh, a dragoon is a mounted soldier who fights with like sabers, pistols, carbines, whatever. Not much else is known about Redman, except for on uh, June 11th, 1823, he actually applied for a veteran's pension as a veteran of the American Revolution. And one week later, he was awarded the pension and so we know that he served in the war and we know that he was a member of a cavalry unit because it was on his pension thing. And he was one of the few black men that uh, actually served in the cavalry unit. I talked about the Bucks. I'd like to talk about the Rhode Island 1st Regiment a little bit now. They were created during the, that harsh winter at Valley Forge that we all know so much about. They were an all black regiment. They consisted of 125 men. Some were free blacks and some were slaves. Um, their first engagement was the Battle of Newport uh, in 1778. And at that battle, the Continental Army actually was forced to retreat. And the Rhode Island 1st Regiment put itself between the retreating Americans and the British. So basically you have the Continental Army is running away. They have to retreat because they're losing. So they're, they're, they're retreating. And Rhode Island 1st Regiment stood between the retreating Continental Army and the British Army that was advancing on them. And they were able to hold that line against at least three attacks by the British. And in these three attacks, the British suffered heavy casualties. Their bravery saved their lives, 
And after the battle, um, a Hessian officer requested the transfer because he feared for his life. He did not want to fight against these people again. He said that they were so brave and so capable that he didn't want no part of that. He was afraid he was going to get killed, so he asked for a transfer. And he also thought that his own men might kill him because of the heavy losses that they took from the Rhode Island First. Um, in 1781, the Rhode Island First uh, came to the rescue again. This was at the Battle of uh, Croton River. The commander, Colonel Green, was mortally injured. And uh, William Nell, he was an author. He published a book in uh, 1855 about the Black Patriots. And he wrote that Colonel Green, the commander of the regiment, was cut down and mortally wounded. But the sabers of the enemy only reached him through the bodies of his faithful guard of blacks who hovered over him and every one of whom was killed. So he had a group of, of black soldiers that were guarding him. And when he fell and was injured, the British were trying to finish him off. And they had to go through all these black guys that were guarding him. And they stood strong and they faithfully guarded the colonel until every one of them was killed. I mean, even though that, that wound was fatal that he received, you had members of the Rhode Island First that formed a barrier around him. And instead of retreating and getting out of there like they could have and abandoning him to the enemy, they chose instead to die with their commander in an honorable way. And the rest of the unit continued to fight for like the entire war. And a remnant of the original regiment, so a, a small portion of that original regiment, was actually present with George Washington to surrender at Yorktown at the end of the war. The next gentleman's name is Peter Salem. Salem was a slave and a celebrated marksman. After the battles of Lexington and Concord, soldiers from all over Massachusetts, Connecticut, and Rhode Island assembled outside of Boston to confront the 5,000 British troops that were stationed there. That con uh, confrontation was called the Battle of Bunker Hill, and it began well for the Americans until they ran out of ammo. Um, at that point, Major John Pitkern, who had led the troops at the Battle of Lexington, mounted the hill and called the day is ours. It may have been a victory for the British, but it came at a very dear price because Peter Salem, the marksman, he raised his musket and he shot uh, Major Pitkern. He threw the British into confusion because here they thought they had won the day. They thought, we won this battle. And then all of a sudden, boom, their commander's dead because of Salem. There are several more, and maybe I will do another show on this topic, but I'm running out of time. So I'd like to sum up instead. Basically, what I want to say is that I hope the gentleman that I spoke with who did not believe that his people had a stake in America, that he did not believe that his people had a piece of the promise of the greatness of America. I hope that I hope that he listens to this show. You know, I, I've told him about it, and I'm going to send him the link when it hits the YouTube channel because I really want him to know, and I want I want all of the all of the black people that that aren't aware of this section of history out there that are listening. I, I want you to know that your people have played a pivotal and vital role in in the formation of this country. You know, don't ever let anyone steal this rich and wonderful history from you. It, it's, it's a damn shame and it's a travesty that, that nobody talks about this. I think this should be taught in every history class, but it's just not. I mean, when, when I went to school and I learned about the Revolutionary War, I didn't learn anything about any black people that were in the Revolutionary War. I learned all about Paul Revere and how he rode through town saying the British are coming, but nobody told me that he wasn't the only writer that night. And there was actually a black man who did the exact same thing and actually warned people before Paul Revere did that the British were coming, but they didn't talk about him in my history class. None of these gentlemen that I spoke about tonight were mentioned in any of my history classes that I took, but they were great men. I mean, they were awarded commendations. I, I talked about four of them that were awarded commendations and medals from George Washington himself, the guy that would become the first president of the United States, the father of our country, who had a personal friendship with some of these men. But they're just kind of lost to history, you know? People don't know about them. And I think that's really sad. I really do. And I hope that, that this show, I hope that it raises some awareness. And I hope that people listen to this and, and they share it. Share this on social media. Send it to your friends. Let everybody know about these amazing men and what they did for our great nation. And to that young black man who, who I was speaking to, and to any other black people that are listening, hold your head up, man. Hold your damn head up high because you guys have just as much stake in this country as we do. You fought and you bled 
and in some cases you died just as much as we did to guarantee freedom. So I, I want to leave you with that thought. Thank you, brother. And that was very interesting. I want people to understand something. I didn't even know about this. I mean, I know he did a show. This should tell you something. I've only known about it for the last week. And that's a travesty that these African-American soldiers have never been rewarded for this or even talked about this at all in the schools or colleges. Maybe in some colleges, but I've never got taught it in school. I knew about Civil War like and stuff like that, that African-Americans had a big part of that because, you know, helping us win against the South. And I know even that, even the South, African-Americans were actually in the South, too, because the, the, the South offered them uh, a free from slavery. Like that movie Glory and stuff like that. That that I knew about that, but I never knew in the Revolutionary War that African-Americans had a big part in it more than they, they don't even say nothing. Almost fifteen to 20,000 troops. That's ridiculous. It's not being taught in school. And I want to thank these people. God bless their souls because they're rest in peace. They passed away either from old age or killed in the war. But I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for helping us against at the time, the British are not enemies anymore, but they were. And you gave your life for our freedom. And you guys should get recognition for that. And I don't understand why this isn't getting recognized. I, I, it's, it's crazy to me because this is the first time I heard anything about it. And I, I'm embarrassed of that. It, it not, it's not my fault, but it was never taught to me. James is the first thing I've ever heard from the show. He, the earlier when he ta talked about this and I've heard him tell me before and that's a travesty and that's not right and it should have been taught in school and these people should be getting credit for going to war and dying and get credited more than they did because it's hardly even talked about I finally found a lot of stuff there's stuff on YouTube you guys want to look this up check it on YouTube check it on the internet there's even books but I didn't even know for the, what is, I'm almost 40 years old, that this even happened till this last week. And that's sad. And I hope people, this brings awareness. The show can help bring awareness to the African Americans who gave their life for the, that war. And maybe they can one day can get credited for this more than they are. And talked about this more than they are. Because it's not right. The Revolutionary War... Come to find out, George Washington had 15% of his army were African Americans. And you don't get, to, I didn't get taught that. I knew there was, there was a few, but I never knew anything. I never, I never knew that. This is something new to me. I've only known for a couple weeks. Because James has talked about it. He's wanted to do this show very, for a long time. And now I've learned. And I hope. One day they get recognition for what they did. Because that's crazy. That this time that I finally found this out because I had to hear it from my, my co-host and not from schools. Because I graduated high school, elementary, junior high. I never heard any of it. I heard that they were slaves. I've ever, you know, that that's just always gets talked about. But never they get any recognition that was that many. Almost fifteen to 20,000. And, and they were, they, the Brit and, and also they had British too, and, you know, and I, I didn't even, even hear the British side of it. I don't even think they teach it. I never heard anything from it before except to this episode right now. So that should tell you something. And that's sad that that guy that you were talking to, James, that young African-American, didn't know it either. Because it should be taught to him, and he didn't even know his own history because they're not teaching it. They're not talking about it. They're not even, I mean, I, I, barely, I, I barely heard anything, and then when I read about it, there is some stuff about it, but it's never been talked about, really. It's not in school. Only a little bit here and there, but nothing like, like what I've been reading. God, this is bigger than what they portray. You know, maybe because they only had 15, 20,000, but God, they died. some of them died for our country. You know, they fought against the British, and they even fought for the British because they were trying to get free. Because they ran away from their slaves. Because at the time, the South and the North weren't on agreement on that either. So, so some of the slaves ran off to join the British. And I really am glad now, James, I'm glad you brought this to my attention. That 
I finally found this great information. And a lot of people should really look this up and give thanks to these men. They deserve the recognition. Especially on Memorial Day for you all you all you guys in the military. Thank you. And God bless you. Blessed be whatever you believe in. Thank you for your kind service, for giving your life for us to have this country we live in right now. Because if it wasn't for you, we wouldn't be here. Or we'd be doing something different in a different world. And you'll never find a country where you can be as free as we are. As much as some people don't want to believe that, it's true. And thank you for your service. And I want to thank everybody for listening to Staring into the Abyss on Parax or on YouTube or wherever, on Facebook. Thank you very much. And to our soldiers, thank you who have given their lives. You, you don't even know how much I love you because I love this country. And if it wasn't for you, we wouldn't be doing what we're doing. And thank you very much for your service to the military all over the world. Rest your peace, whoever passed away. My grandfather, my late great grandfather, my grandfa other grandfather were all in the military. And thank you. And my uncle was in Vietnam and the Korean War. And I want to thank them. And I want to thank all our fans. If you want to listen to all our uh, old episodes, new episodes, just check out James Hershey's uh, YouTube page. Subscribe. You can get merch. He'll tell you where to go and what to uh, website to go to. I just want to say thank you. I'm glad you listen to us every week. Thank you to our military. You, we, I owe you everything. Because if it wasn't for you guys, we, like I said, our country wouldn't be free. And I'm proud of it to say that I'm American. And all I got to say is good night, sugar ladies, misfits, and demon hunters. And to our military, I love you. Blessed be, and have a great night. I want to give a special thank you to all of our troops. Everyone who has ever put on the uniform and served their country, whether you fought and died in a war, or whether you fought in a war or you served in peace, I want to say from the bottom of my heart, thank you, and I love you very much. To the families, of all of those brave soldiers. I'm going to say thank you to you guys as well. Because I know firsthand, I spent my entire life in the military. And I know firsthand how hard and how sometimes agonizing it is to be a family member and to watch the people that you love go off to war. I see you guys. I know what you're going through. I know that struggle. I've been there. To all of our amazing vets that I run into down at the VA and some of these events I do, you guys continue. Every single time I talk to you, you continue to inspire me and to honestly leave me in awe. You guys are the true heroes. A lot of people think that I'm crazy for doing this topic tonight. They say that a white southerner from the mountains of Virginia ought to stay about as far away from race as humanly possible in this politically correct society that we live in now. But I reject that. We are all children of the same great and mighty God. I don't care what color you are. I don't care whether you're a man or whether you're a woman. I don't care what God you choose to pray to. Or if you choose to not pray to one at all. I don't care what country you lay your head down at night to sleep in. You are all my brothers 
and my sisters. And I open my heart and my arms to every single one of you in the spirit of love, friendship, and family. Regardless of what you think of me, don't ever let other people tell you what you're supposed to think. Don't let other people decide how you are going to live your life. Remember, hate is a choice. But love is a much, much better one. Thank you guys for everything. Until we speak to you again, love many, trust few, and do harm to none. God loves you, and so do we. Bye-bye.